my name is Dell, and I'm a full-time day trader and educator over at ActiveTraders.chat. I'm proud to announce a new series, Bear vs. Pig, candid interviews with micro to small cap stock traders. Unlike any other series you'll hear online, it's not catered towards beginners, and we are exploring a very specific niche in stock trading. This is a series of interviews with seasoned day traders who have found themselves trading inside one of the stock market's most volatile and shrouded niches. These are traders that for the most part, primarily short stocks. They place large bets on low float, micro to small cap stocks that are usually upside down fundamentally, have run maybe two, three, four, five hundred percent in the past, sometimes in a single day. These are traders that have managed to break through the gauntlet that is discretionary day trading. They've become profitable and have emerged on the other side triumphant with a strangled pig or two under their boot. And to clarify, no animals were hurt in the making of this podcast. Instead, I'm referring to what the community has affectionately named piggies. Stocks that are low float, micro to small cap, usually under $10, upside down fundamentally and have a history of getting pumped and dumped by bad actors. Let's lift the veil and begin exploring the minds behind this niche. So today I'm interviewing Hammer Trader, a day trader from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, which is actually pretty close to where I live here in Toronto. So I first stumbled across Hammer on Twitter. When I saw that he was posting educational material on YouTube, I got really interested. And what really caught my eye was when he began posting about his own style of fundamental analysis. Now, fundamental analysis is one of those things that's very difficult to learn for a lot of traders. You'll find tons of material online about technical analysis. But what Hammer was doing was he was showing viewers how to sift through the maze that is SEC corporate filings, giving, really giving them a breakdown of what they need to look for. And inside there lies one of the most underexplored and undervalued topics uh, by novice traders, which is is the company that I'm about to short fundamentally sound or not? And how does that affect my trading? So in this interview, we learn more about Hammer Trader, how he got started, and then why and how he uses this fundamental analysis uh, to help him make better decisions in the volatile, small to micro cap world of day trading. Cool. All right, well, let's get started. I'll let you in intro yourself because I don't know all the details about you. Um, so we'll definitely do that. Um, and if you want to find hammer trader online, you can find him on Twitter at hammer trader. So that's at hammer underscore trader. And on YouTube, you can search for him. Uh, just search hammer trader as I don't think you have a, um, um, a direct URL on YouTube yet, right? No, not yet. <laughs> Okay, so that'll that'll come with more subscribers and stuff, but some really awesome videos. And I think my favorite video of all of your videos is the um, understanding the basics and uh, basics of important SEC filings. I think that's a fantastic video. And we're definitely going to dive into that fundamental stuff and start uncovering some of your thoughts on that. But uh, to start off, Hammer Trader, do we call you Hammer Trader? Um, and uh, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me here. I'm thrilled. Uh, so I was originally born in Romania, and I came to Canada when I was just six years old. I actually moved to Toronto, so I lived the better part of my life in Toronto, you know, maybe about 20 years, and then I ended up moving into the Niagara region, which is uh, extremely beautiful, and now I reside in Hamilton. Um, so the name Hammer Trader doesn't come from the fact that I'm a short trader who likes to hammer the bids. It comes from the fact that Hamilton has a nickname and it's the Hammer. So that's where that name originates from. And so how long have you been trading? Um, what kind of things do you trade and what's your background like in, in terms of did you go to school or did, did you have a career in something? Uh, yeah, I've been trading for three, four years now. Um, can't remember the exact time because, you know, you st initially start off part-time trading or even just reading about stocks online. And then you end up finding some kind of chat rooms and you find day trading strategies and you just jump down that rabbit hole, which leads you from cookie crumb to cookie crumb and you end up where you're at. Um, but before that, I was actually at um, university finishing up my master's. So I finished a master's in chemistry. 
and uh, my plan was to be a university professor. I always loved teaching, so that was the original plan. Um, but I wanted to take a year off before I went and did my PhD. So I did take that year off, and I ended up working at car dealerships doing sales for that year just because I needed money, not you know for any other reason. Um, it was relaxing, and this is exactly what I wanted to do in that year off. But on that year off, my wife bought me a book a feel good business book. And that sparked my desire to learn about stocks and trading. So I started learning and you know, one thing led to another and I didn't end up going back for my PhD. Now I'm trading full time and couldn't be happier. Wow, so you have a, you have a one single book to attribute to your current success? Yeah, pretty much. I'll actually not the book. My wife, she, she was the brains behind it. <laughs> your wife. That's that's the correct answer. That was a trick question. Um, and um, what was your PhD in, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, so my master's in chemistry. I was looking at. Um, I was doing it in biomedical engineering. So we were trying to develop a biosensor that detected the spread of breast cancer. Wow. Do you find that that background helped you in the types of stocks that you're trading right now? I know that a lot of these micro caps and small caps are pharmaceutical or bio related. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, my master's was a hundred percent very analytics based and that's exactly what I'm doing right now. The only other way I can describe it is, you know, I was looking at lines and graphs back then and I got to still do that now, which was, basically my favorite part of doing my master's. Wow. That's really, really cool. Would you ever go back to finish? I can't see myself going back now, especially because, you know, I, I completely see a different future for myself now that I'm a stock trader. But originally that was the plan. Yeah. I guess when you get the calling, you just sort of have to answer, right? It doesn't matter where you are in your life. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. And I, I had no idea that this thing would go this far. I initially just started out with me buying, you know, buying tops and selling bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> the the one thing that I think a lot of traders have in common, um, I know from mentoring quite a few traders, is that they have a point in their life where they decide that they want to take control of their own finances. Um, usually it's a moment or something that happened or maybe something that they grew up with um, in a family situation. So. Uh, what was your moment? Like when, when did you hand over or take back the, the reins from uh, um, the people that would handle your, your investments in like a mutual fund or something like that? Um, pretty much, you know, within six months of starting to day trade, I was quite overzealous and I said, nope, I'm doing all of this by myself. Do you do any other types of trading besides uh, stock trading? Uh, no, just stock trading for now. Um, I've been definitely getting into options in the last little while and trying to learn about those. Um, but right now my bread and butter is stocks, equities. So tell us a little bit about that niche. Um, now people that are listening to this uh, are likely trading stocks as well. Some of them might be traders from another area like futures or options trading and might want to know more about this niche of um, that is a lot of short selling, but there's also people with long biases uh, in this niche. So maybe tell us a little bit about your niche, uh, what what kind of stocks you like to trade and why. Yeah, so I am I would consider myself 85% short bias, 15% long bias. Um, I really do feel a lot more at home shorting stocks than I do longing, but if there's a good long setup, I, I won't hesitate to take it. I pretty much live in the realm of the small cap land. I do play mid caps and large caps, especially during earning seasons. Um, but apart from that, I, I tend to stick mostly with the small caps. Um, the way I, I saw it when I first started shorting was stocks don't need to go up. There's nothing pushing them up, but there's always something weighing them down. There's always some kind of regression to some mean or some kind of pullback that's guaranteed. Right, there's no guarantee a stock will go up, but if it does go up, you're at least guaranteed that it'll pull back even the slightest amount. Yeah, 100 percent. And a lot of the time, we'll see these stocks that uh, go up, and they go up. Sometimes they go up so much that they make the news, 
And once they make the news, uh, a lot of other people start jumping on that have long bias. And I think that sort of strengthens the position for a lot of short traders as well. Um, yeah, ag agreed. Mm -hmm. You definitely don't want to be part of the herd, right? Um, it's just like the best example I can relate with that is the Bitcoin boom in December. December, sorry. Um, I remember, you know, everybody and their grandma was talking about how now is the time to buy Bitcoin. And this was when it was $18,000, $20,000 per Bitcoin. And it obviously tanked, right? As a trader, when you're looking at that chart and you're saying, uh-oh, this thing is going parabolic and everybody else is telling me to buy it, what's going to happen? It's probably going to tank. I know that for me, when I started uh, shorting stocks, it was the scariest thing in the world because... I figured every stock needs to go up. Um, and that's that's really what, when, when I realized that the, most of these stocks deserve to be lower, much, much lower, uh, basically to the point of being delisted, then that gave me the confidence to short all of those pops and really create a strategy around it. Uh, but I think the one of the, the biggest things that I had to overcome, and I think a lot of other traders have to overcome, is learning to think against the mindset of the herd. So maybe you can talk to us a little bit of how, how you overcame that yourself. Yeah, well, I mean, we're all human, right? So at the beginning, you're engineered to see something go up and then you you just want to think, oh man, this is going up, it must continue going up. So you chase the long and you end up buying it right at the top and then it goes against you and you end up having to sell. So that's generally how you know, every trader starts out, they start out not being profitable because there's human emotion and human nature that has to be beaten out of them through losses and through con continued practice. Um, definitely shorting goes against the human mindset. Uh, you're betting on things to go down. Naturally, as humans, we want to see things go up, right? We want to see our society continue to increase in its knowledge. We want to see countries grow in wealth everything is going up and that's what we're taught as kids you know even climbing the ladder at a company it's always up up is subconsciously engineered into everybody's mindset so once you can break out of that then you can become more successful especially if you're shorting right um but it's not just about thinking oh look the stock is up i'm going to short it here I use a whole picture approach to trading. I incorporate technical analysis, fundamental analysis, and market psychology. All three of those things together help me piece a trade, a successful trade. Um, there's usually not just one reason for me to enter the stock. You know, it's not like I see a pattern and I'm saying, oh man, look at this descending triangle. I'm going to short it here. No, there's usually six, seven, eight, nine, ten reasons for me to enter a stock, right? all of the technical analysis, fundamental analysis and market psychology aspects have to line up and then I'm in that trade. And how do you go about finding stocks? I use trade ideas as scanners. So I've developed and built these scanners over several years and I'm still constantly optimizing them, but they're at a point right now where I trust them fully and they basically alert alert me to the things in my niche and they alert me to them before the crowd knows so i'm already watching things and formulating plans before people even notice about them mm -hmm. yeah i think that's one of the strong things about trade ideas and you know i i think i i personally had fumbled around quite a bit until i found a scanner that let me be as flexible as i wanted to be in uh in terms of exercising what's on paper um, and then really boiling those stocks down to a few. Um, yeah, trade ideas is definitely like one of the one of the big ones. Have you tried any of the trade ideas um, AI capabilities yet? Like Holly and uh, other AI? No, I haven't. Um, I hear good things from other people that use them, but right now, trade ideas is doing everything for me that I could possibly want. I don't know what what else I need from it. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that you do. You, you combine technical analysis, fundamental analysis, and market psychology. But before we get into those, which I know will be a, definitely a longer conversation, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your strategy as a whole um, and then how you, how you personally manage risk. Yeah, so 
Um, essentially, my strategy for trading is looking for imbalances of supply and demand. I'm always trying to find a place where the supply significantly outweighs the demand, which makes it for a profitable shorting opportunity. But the best part of the way I trade is the way I scale. Scaling is essentially my risk management. So if I'm jumping in there, I'm always jumping in there with a starter. And the starter could be one fifth to one tenth of my total size. And I'm usually either getting stopped out on that starter or I'm getting confirmation that what's about to happen is really going to happen. And when I get that confirmation, that's when I size in with the remainder of my position. So my losers are always small and my winners are always significantly larger than my losers. And that's what you need to do if you want to be profitable, profitable in this game, especially if you're shorting, because you have to factor in commissions, you have to factor in borrow fees, you have to factor in slippage, and you need to get a good risk to reward on that trade. So there's a lot of things that need to be factored in in order for you to be profitable. But if you scale your position, that helps really put the odds in your favor. And and how do you decide um, how much to scale into? That's a, that's a loaded question again. Uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> taking into account everything, right? The technical analysis, fundamental analysis and market psychology when everything lines up then I'm smashing it with huge size. When you know only a, a few things are lining up, I'm probably going in with much smaller size, maybe a feeler size, and I'm maybe not looking to hold it for as long. A lot of times my best setups are the ones where I jump in and if this thing just continues to fade and fade and fade and fade. My worst setups are the ones where I jump in and I know it's a pretty crappy setup, so I have to just expect a scalp. So I'm in, I'm out, I got my money and I'm done with it. Uh, for for me, I think I found that uh, talking to other traders, uh, there's people that are you know far on the uh, side of rules based. And then there's people that are on, on the completely other side where they just want to build that confidence in a stock to a point where they feel confident getting in. Uh, so it seems like you're leaning towards that. Yeah, I, I think that's... That's pretty accurate, um, but don't get me wrong. I'm, I, I consider myself a very defensive trader. I use very tight stops and I don't mind going in and out of something four times before I really nail it. I mean, I think I had my biggest ever play on BLIN just one or two weeks ago um, where I was six times lev leveraged of my account on that thing because I had a lot of conviction in what it was about to do. So. I ended up having to jump in and out of that three or four times before I finally loaded the boat and rode the thing down. Mm -hmm. I must have felt good. It was kind of terrifying when you're that highly leveraged, but uh, it was pretty awesome. And out of all the trades that you make, these like small starter size trades that you jump into, how many of those do you think actually work out? Well, I use TraderView to track my stats. So I can tell you that I my win rate is anywhere between 70 and 75%. So all of my trades, regardless of whether they're small singles or home runs, they fall into that 70 to 75% accuracy. So, you know, there's a good chance that if I'm playing four stocks, three out of the four, I'll be right on. Yeah, that's really cool. I use TraderView as well. I, I love their, their tools and how they sort of just connect to your broker if you're lucky enough to have a broker that connects to them. Oh, it's uh, unbelievable. That's yeah. a great service. Oh yeah, for sure. So what do you have like any specific setups that you look for every day? Like out of all these trades, are they all based on heavy and heavy on the technical analysis or are they heavy on the fundamental analysis? I'd say it's pretty much even 50, 50. Um, my best plays are the ones that have, something weighing the stock down from the technical side and something weighing the stock down from the fundamental side. So, you know, maybe it's a day three um, run of the stock and it's looking to pop up and then it, it's so overextended that it needs to come down. So from the technical standpoint, there's a check mark there, but maybe there's also an offering looming overhead um, for this stock that, you know, will potentially happen um, after hours. So I know, you know, 
a lot of times it'll probably sell off a little bit into that and then really tank. So I'll be holding um, the stock into after hours in anticipation for that looming offering. Can you dissect that a little bit more, that last piece? Through after hours, a lot of times companies tend to release their offerings after hours. Well, at least the ones that I've been tracking, sometimes they release offerings pre-market and you know that happens at like 7.30, 7.45, 8 a.m. But a lot of times it'll happen after hours. And if you know the company is strapped for cash and they need to, um, they need to raise and they're going to be doing it ASAP, then you might as well be holding to 4.35 um, because there's a good chance that that offering is coming. And when it does come, that's when payday comes. Oh, interesting. That's, that's a really uh, a good one. And so on that type of trade, you would be loading the boat, I'm guessing? Yeah, on, t- on that type of trade, I'm definitely loading the boat because everything lines up. Gotcha. And do you have any specific chart patterns or anything in the order flow that you look for in order to initiate your trade? What kind of a trigger do you use? For me, volume is king. Um, so as I was saying before, I'm looking for supply and demand imbalances. So when I'm noticing that the volume does not line up with the price action, the price is at a point where the volume does not justify it, then that will be a place that I'm looking for. I'm very big into charting. So um, every candle means something to me. And uh, I put the one minute and the three minute charts usually, and I use those as my trading tools. Um, With the fundamentals, I'm always doing my research pre-market on something that pops up on my scanner pre-market. So I'll do, you know, 15, 20 minutes of research because now it's so automated my process. I know exactly what I'm looking for. I'm extracting my information. Um, I have this 2000 page encyclopedia on everything that I've ever played. And it has every picture of each day that each stock ran plus notes on the fundamentals for that company that is constantly being updated every time that company runs. So it's definitely wow. something I check every single time that a stock runs. Yeah, that's really impressive. A lot of people don't have the level of diligence that you do. Um, and how long have you been keeping that book for? Is it the, the entire time you've been trading or? Uh, no, it started about two years ago. So, you know, if you do the math, it's about a thousand pages per, per year. <laughs> wow. That's pretty healthy. But the, like, like we were talking before, um, finding an edge, right? You want to be giving yourself every possible advantage so that you have as much edge in your court compared to, you know, the average Joe or the herd trader. Yeah. And finding that edge and then keeping that edge through all the market ups and downs as the market changes. Like right now, through earnings season, we are not getting a lot. But um, I'm finding that it's a little bit crowded on some of the names like today's AWX trade. I I agree. There's been a lot of crowded trades, especially in July. Um, AWX, I think what made it crowded was having some hidden player you know, who just decided to connect their their controller and say, hey, I'm playing this game too, and nobody knows I'm playing it. That's what made it crowded on that that one. But there's been so many crowded trades these last couple of weeks where you're seeing 40 to 60 million shares traded in a day, and it's just, it's ridiculous. It's just choppy. It's faking out both longs and shorts. The plays aren't as clean. So a lot of times I'm looking for the peripheral plays, the ones that just pop up on my scanner that nobody else is watching, but... You know, I I might think that these plays are really good based off of having played them in the past and checking my encyclopedia, and so I'll most likely play play that instead of the main main bad boy of the day. Yeah, I've noticed that a lot of those stocks um, have really nasty spreads a lot of the time. Does the the le- the level of like if you have a really big spread on a stock but it's setting up the way you like it, uh, do you do anything to mitigate that? Well, it depends. I remember playing HMNY back in the day, like, I don't know, two years ago, back when I was still trading at like eight, nine, ten dollars $10. And that thing used to have like dollar spreads. You know, the bid was ten fifty, the ask was eleven fifty. So something Nasty. like that. Yeah, it's disgusting. I'm, I'm going in with significantly smaller size, um, wider stops. So I'm trying to do everything I can to still put that ball in my court. 
because it's so much choppier and so easy for you to get um, faked out. And a lot of times I'm trying to not hit the bid on these, right? If it, it's okay to hit the bid on something that has a one, two cent spread, but you can't hit the bid on something that has a dollar spread. You need to be placing those orders um, very cautiously. Oh yeah, for sure. And I think that's why those stocks sometimes just turn into a massive chop fest, you'll notice. And honestly, that's what still scares me today about those names is getting into a name and then having a 40 to 80 cent spread go against me and then it never coming back, you know, kind of just hopping over your limit orders, that type of thing. Yeah, definitely. We're, we're not playing in a very risk friendly business. Yeah, definitely not. Um, so just going back to risk. Uh, so for me, what really works is setting an, an R value. And I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with R values. Um, for people that aren't familiar with R values, it's basically a percentage of your account size uh, and you use that to calculate how many cents you're able to lose on a trade. I calculate like a one R value and then I try to scale into that one R as my starter size um, so that when I am putting on more risk, I'm never adding to the loser above my one R. I'm always adding on a winner to increase my one R. Yeah, uh, there's a one chat room that I'm I'm in and uh, it's a private chat room with a couple of close buddies and I know a lot of them use this 1R um, aiming for 3R kind of system and I think it's phenomenal. It's a great system. Um, for me, I use, I think, a deviation of that. I'm still using the R system except I change my R based on um, level of confidence and of setup. So, for example, um, you know, on something that I'm really not liking very much, I'm maybe risking 0.3 R, 0.5 R. Whereas on something like Blinn a few weeks ago where I was super confident, I'm risking 10 R. Did you, you know? start with did you start with that like 0.5 R or whatever on BLIN and then and then work up to your 10 R? Oh yeah, definitely. So I was always scaling in and scaling out. Um like I said, I had to take take the position on and off a couple times until I, it finally did exactly what I wanted it to do, and I got confirmation about it. But if I'm in that big, I'm going to be downsizing when it's not doing what I want, and I'm going to be upsizing when it's doing what I want. You know, go back to 0.5R when it's not doing what I want. Go back up to 5R when it's starting to do what I want, and go up to 10R when it's really confirmed that it's about to do what I want. And... I mean, I guess we can get a little bit into trade management since it seems like conversation is going that way. Uh, so you're scaling up into a trade. It's working, um, you know, your level of confidence through the roof. Um, at what point are you thinking about taking profits? What kind of factors play into that for you? A lot of times it's the technical factors. How up is the stock on the day? How far is it from um, certain moving averages, uh, support and resistance lines, I take all of that into account. Where, uh, where, where is it position? Where is it trading? Sorry, where is it mm -hmm. trading um, relative to its daily range on the day? Right? Is it trading in the upper ten percent or is it trading in the lower twenty percent? Uh, am I short in the upper ten percent or am I short in the lower twenty percent? Right? I can't really expect it to fade from three dollars to two dollars when I'm short at three twenty and it's in the bottom 20 percent of its daily range you know that's just not something that's really reasonable um unless the daily chart allows it to be so it's, it's a bunch of factors once again that come into play but generally it's pretty much just fun uh technicals that line up for this one cool yeah and do you do you find that a lot of those technicals that work better on these smaller cap to micro cap stocks and they do on that on the larger stocks yeah, I I think so, a hundred percent. And with the 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 good thing about the smaller caps is that you don't have the algos and the big players jumping in on them, just because a lot of these companies are trash, fundamentally speaking. So nobody wants to touch them. Whereas you know, if you're playing something like Facebook, which just had its earnings, you know, <laughs> you're gonna have everybody and their institutions playing this thing. So there's gonna be a lot more chop, a lot more noise, and it's all coming from. I'll go trading, right? So I, I've actually, it's really interesting that, for example, the VWAP, I've never seen the VWAP work so well. Like I have a background in futures trading um, and 
I have never seen the VWAP work so well in a market as it does in the um, small to micro cap market here. And I'm not really sure why I still have not really figured that out. I think maybe it's because all of the filings and all of the, um, the, um, the funding that comes through is based around multiples of the VWAP. I don't know. I think that's part of the reason. And the other part is that retail trading has grown so in love with the VWAP that I think everybody and their grandmothers are placing stops at or around VWAP or buy orders or short orders or whatever, that it's just become, you know, such a point of resistance or support. Yeah. And institutional traders, you know, they're rewarded for buying or selling near the VWAP, right? I mean, that's one of their their main uh, systems. Okay, so your volume forecasts is something that you use in order to um, identify whether a stock is going to continue uh, running higher or is going to fade for the rest of the day. Um, can you first maybe tell us about what volume forecasts are um, and how you use them in the, in this market? Yeah, so volume forecasting is essentially taking certain data points um, inputting them into some kind of calculator that will then project an end of day volume for you. Um, you can use this end of day volume depending on how you segment it to gauge supply and demand throughout the entire day. So usually by around 11 a.m. I have enough data points to input into my calculator which will then spit out an end of day volume forecast. And I use this end of day volume forecast to gauge supply and demand. Um, like today, I think on AWX, this is the day three that I was running. I think my volume forecast was 8.4 million shares on AWX. And uh, the end of the day volume right now, we're about 10 minutes from close. is 9.9. Yeah, we're at 9.95 right now. So it's surpassed it by um, over 1 million. Generally, if there's volume forecasts that have the projected versus end of day discrepancy like that where the actual end of day volume is significantly larger than the projected it means something funny is happening the way i have my model tailored to is for all day faders so i've statistically analyzed as many all day faders as i could get and i've created this model and when i forecast my volume if the volume stays at or under the forecasted volume a lot of times that stock that I'm playing will usually end up being an all day fader. If it goes above it, there's usually funny business and, or it's not an all day fader. Wow. That's really interesting. Um, I, and I've seen this type of stuff be mentioned on Twitter here and there. Um, I've always thought that the volume forecasts or the ones that I use anyway are basically just based on a filing or, or, um, future dilution plans, things like that. Uh, but you, what you're doing, I think, is you're you're taking volume from a specific time period in the morning and extrapolating it out to the end of the day on something like a, a spreadsheet, right? Yeah, that's right. So um, the way I see it is the market has already digested everything else out there, all the fundamentals, all the filings that need to come. Um, so essentially, I only look at volume and time. Mm -hmm. uh, because the the best of fa faders have some kind of time decay model applied to them. And oh, that's what I, I base my model off of. And so you're saying that the volume that the stock puts in, let's say in the first hour of trading or in, in the pre-market or whatever, is, is uh, indicative of the volume that it's going to have for the rest of the day? Yeah, that's right. If it's planning to go the way that I want, which is usually to fade all day, yes, that's right. How did you stumble upon that? Volume forecasting? Yeah. I saw somebody else doing it on Twitter, and then I was just looking at it and toying with it and incorporating data points and whatnot. And <laughs> it's it's <laughs> essentially like research, like what I was doing in my master's. I was tasked with the problem and then I had to solve it. So I just continued and continued and continued until I found something that worked. Wow. And it's pretty accurate for you, I guess. Yeah, that's right. So I'm actually looking at my spreadsheet right now and 
I'm looking at my average volume forecasts and my volume forecasts on average come within 97% of the total end of day volume. So the, the sort of the volume an analysis that we do is based around uh, standard distributions. So a distribution of volume in a bell curve and having that on the volume at price allows you to see what areas are have unfair value and fair value. And so the, 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 the one point on the chart where the volume has traded the most at a specific price level is also known as the volume point of control for a day or the VPOC. And I found that in the small cap to micro cap uh, market that um, any time there is a distribution of volume that is uh, incomplete or it has like a really deep unfair value point where not a lot of volume has been traded at a specific price level, it sort of becomes like a magnet. And I picture price being like this little worker that has to go around and fill in these these areas of unfair value and, and create that really nice bell curve. And so I'm just, when I hear you talking about your volume forecast and how much volume needs to be deposited, I'm starting to think, where does that volume need to be deposited? Uh, but if That's I were, fascinating. if I were to, if I were to draw a, um, or I don't know, calculate the number of times that a, a gap in volume at price has been filled inside of a, a day, um, I think it would be really, really high. Just shooting that's, from the hip. That's fascinating. No, like I, I've never heard an approach like this um, towards looking at volume, and I think that's that's really wonderful. And it probably stems from your background in futures trading. Um, but I, I definitely can see and understand, you know, the background of what you're saying behind uh, market auction theory, or I think you call it auction market theory. W which one is it? <laughs> I call it market auction theory. Right. Um, I use that to some extent. I use volume profile which essentially shows volume at price. And I use it to help gauge who's underwater. Are shorts underwater? Are longs underwater? How much fuel is there for the fire? You know, yeah. is this thing, if, it, if this thing goes below the bell curve, as you were, you were saying, um, how much fuel is there to, uh, for the longs that are, are going to have to bail and there's going to be a washout? Or if this thing goes above the bell curve, then how much fuel is there for the short squeeze that might happen? That's uh, that's really interesting stuff and really cool to hear. And I think a lot of the, these conversations are never had on podcasts because so but thanks even for, for novice traders. I think this is great. You know, if I'm listening to this and I'm saying, oh, my goodness, what the heck is market auction theory? What am I going to do? I'm going to go and Google it. I'm going to go learn about it. So I think this is wonderful. Uh, touching about all these topics that you might never hear in other podcasts. Great point. Great, great point. Yeah, totally on your side for that. OK, so. Let's let's try and jump on to uh, some of the fundamental analysis stuff that that you've put out on YouTube because I think people have heard a lot about tape reading and order flow and all that type of stuff and I'm sure you use one one or two of those things in your trading but I'm I'm more interested in hearing about that video that you created understanding the basics of imp important SEC filings why did you create that video uh, how important is that to your trading and how do you use it. I created the video because there's such a lack of content for learning about fundamental analysis online. And I think a lot of traders want to learn, but they have no idea where to start. So this kind of helps them dip their toes into getting familiarized with basic SEC filings. Um, you don't really become a master of SEC filings until you've read, you know, a million SEC filings. You just got to read and read and read and read. And when you don't know something, you Google it and you figure it out. Very um, boring. Very boring, but I've grown to really enjoy reading 10 Qs and 10 Ks. Um, I, it's just something I do. It's part of my daily routine now. So for me, fundamental analysis is a pretty big part of my trading. Yeah, so you have uh, in the video, uh, and I made some notes on this video because I think it's, it's really cool that you pick out which forums to take a look at. So the forums that you use, say, to look at, are form four, which is the insider holdings changes, form three, which is the, uh, there's a new issuer um, or a first time equity buyer, something like that. Um, and then obviously we have the 10Q slash 10K, which are the financial reports uh, for the quarter and for the year. Uh, we have the 8K, which is material changes. 
Um, and then you have uh, the SC13 D and G, um, which are more than 5% voting in shares and more than 5% of outstanding shares. And uh, I like how you make the distinction between D is sort of like a passive and G is like an active. Uh, the uh, And I highlighted this one with a circle around it, like it, you told us to in the video as well, the S3, which is a shelf public offering. Uh, and this is where you look for a dilution at what date and how, by how much. Um, um, is there anything out of there that you want to pick out and uh, talk more about? I think the S3 is, is definitely key, right? If you have a stock that has the S3 filed and they're going to need to raise an offering and they're going to need to use that offering to get more money. They're going to be dumping those shares on the market. That's going to push the price down. They're doing all the hard work for you. You just need to be able to notice that that's happening and then jump on board. You ride the wave, you ride the trend. Uh, like for example, HMNY, they just did a one for 250 reverse split. I think yesterday where it became from 25 cents to $25 or you know, 10 cents, $25, whatever it was, but now it's already back to $7. And why is that? <laughs> it's because they have a $1.2 billion shelf. These guys are literally printing money <laughs> and pumping the stock down. It doesn't get easier than that. Yeah. And, and what's crazy about that one is I think the broker sent me an email saying you cannot trade this stock. Basically you have like hundred percent margin on it. If you want to short it, Go yeah, we'll center point right? yourself is what they told me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's too easy, too easy money. Um, but uh, so, so let's say you open up an S3. Uh, you have a volume forecast that you you've extrapolated. Um, and uh, does this factor in at all into your volume forecast? No, my volume forecast is 100% just time and volume. Um, like I said, I already think that the market has digested that information that's that's my theory anyway so i only use time and volume um plus i find that a lot of times with dilution the big boys who are unloading the shares they're only doing it when they have liquidity and that's in the morning you want to you know they have the, all these level two games where they flash certain bids or asks to manipulate the price point to go in their direct direction so that they can end up selling more shares and they can only do that when they have liquidity and volume. And that's usually in the first, you know, hour of trading. After that, the dilution kind of stops. But, you know, mm -hmm. it's like putting somebody who doesn't know how to fight in the boxing ring with Muhammad Ali and telling him to go 15 rounds, right? Muhammad Ali is just going to knock him out very quickly. And then that stock's going to be dead. It's not going to recover. It's just going to continue fading usually until the end of the day because whatever longs are still in there. Because usually it's a bag holder chart uh, that that needs to raise money anyways. They're just going to be selling and it's just going to push the price down a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But the fastest way it's going to tank is usually in the first hour, hour and a half of trading. Wow. And and once you've identified that, you've already gone like 60% of the way, right? Now you just need to find an entry and start managing a trade. Yeah, usually I can spot um, dilution happening in pre-market. So if things line up really well, um, I had a lot of great dilution plays in June and I was just pounding the crap out of them. Each time I would spot it, I'd select a pretty safe entry, jump in there, ride it down and take my profits by 11 a.m. Now, I could have held until the end of the day and a lot of times it does go on, end up going down a little bit more, but it only goes down maybe 10% more. So I've maximized the amount of profits per time. And uh, I think trading efficiency is very important. The preservation of mental capital, right? I don't want to be sitting in front of my screen from 9.30 to 4 p.m. because I'm going to be destroyed at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I want to sit from 9.30 to 11, take the meat of the move and get out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I find that that's, that's, that's one of those key uh, factors in deciding how much to take off is, you know, like how much is it, do I have enough invested in the stock to sit here until the end of the day? And have I taken enough, enough off where I feel safe? Um, and that, you know, I've, I've padded my account enough. So that's a, a nice balance there needs to be found, I guess. Um, okay. So scenario, you've opened up a 10 Q, a quarterly report. Uh, the report shows that the company's underwater, you know, they're spending more, 
the revenues are 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 dipping. Um, they are maybe under an, an ASD rule where they're about to get kicked off of uh, off of the uh, the market, um, and they need financing that type of thing. But there's no financing yet. You know, it just shows that like a 10Q shows that they're underwater, and the stock is being pumped on some press release or something like that. <clears throat> what what do you look for um, inside of those that 10Q or that press release to tell you that it's go time if there's no dilution going on? Um, I have another spreadsheet that basically tracks all the companies from that encyclopedia I was talking about. And there's various calculations that I end up doing from using data in the 10 Qs and 10 Ks. And that spits out certain factors. And when, you know, as, as many of those factors can line up, that helps increase my confidence. If only one of, you know, 10 factors lines up, I'm saying, okay, you know, meh, but if it's all 10 of my factors lining up in the worst possible way where this company is, you know, basically working out of a garbage bin, <laughs> then I'm very interested. I'm extremely interested, even if they don't have an offering or dilution because this company is fundamentally garbage, does not belong where it's at. However, I will note that on the short term time frame, technical analysis is king. So I'm not just going to short blindly and say, oh, this company's trash, so the stock must come down right now. No, you know, there's a variety of factors that can push up the stock and completely blow out your account. Yes, I think within three, four, five days, the stock should return back to where it came from. Mm -hmm. But when it happens is based off of technical analysis. And one more question that I had about the SEC filings was, you didn't include the 424 form, which I believe is an offering. Is there any reason why you didn't include that one in your video? Well, that one's less important in the sense that, you know, if you spot an S3 and you know that they can basically print money and d dump shares on the market whenever they want, then you have an immediate sense of potential dilutive properties happening right now. But if you're waiting for a 424 to come out, which is the offering that is not linked to an S3, then that takes time and that usually affects the stock when it's announced. It doesn't mm -hmm. affect it while it's trading, right? Like I said, if I'm expecting a stock to do something like that, then I'm going to be waiting for it still short in after hours so that they can, you know, mm -hmm. announce their offering on the 8K and then the stock plummets. Mm -hmm. Definitely, uh, the S3 is king. It 100% is. It affects the stock trading so much. And so for people that are Googling right now, um, they need to be Googling S3. Yeah, they need to be looking at the S3 SEC filing. Um, it's commonly known as a shelf as well. So both of those terms can, can be searched for and enjoy reading about it <laughs> yeah and if uh if people wanted to find out more about how to read these and maybe find out more about things like they might not might not know about like quick ratios or other ratios that they can use to judge a company's uh or how well a company's doing in a quarter or a year uh do you have any resources that you may want to share um to get people going on uh, on that type of research yeah, definitely. So in my introduction to day trading video, I go over a, like a broad bunch of concepts, but one of them I mentioned is uh, fundamental analysis. And I go over that very briefly saying that uh, there's a book I really love and it's the fundamentals of corporate finance by Breely, Myers and Marcus. I think that goes over a lot of fundamental analysis using quick ratios and, um, other certain statistics that can be applied for analyzing stocks. So I loved that book. I read it page to page, you know, end to end, and I thought it was fantastic. That is a huge tip because it is, inc as you know, it is incredibly difficult to find uh, traders that trade this niche and then traders that are willing to give you um, a direction on where to learn more about things like SEC filings, 
for day traders. <laughs> so I really don't understand um, the whole mindset that a lot of these guys keep all this information for themselves, you know, helps help help the other person out. You know what I mean? Like if I, when I started trading, it was incredibly difficult. I had nobody to talk to. I didn't know any other trader. All I could do was Google and YouTube. And when I first started trading, I always learned the worst things because the most marketed and the most easily accessible education content is the wrong content on Google and YouTube. You don't want to be learning that stuff. It's all about, you know, pumping low float Momo stocks, you know, the stuff that has sub 1 million share float and that can trade $2 within two minutes. It goes up from three dollars to five dollars and back down to three dollars and fifty cents all within a two minute time frame that is not a trading strategy no definitely not and a lot of people get stuck in that it's a it's a sad story especially for some of the larger trading rooms um uh when you when you see that uh a lot of people are being taken advantage of or being thrown to stocks that are getting pumped Uh, well i i agree and i think it goes back to our conversation on human nature a lot of these bigger chat rooms that advertise, you know, quick profits, they say you can make $10,000 in three minutes, right? That's that's a, appealing to human nature. People don't want to work hard. They don't want to put the time, blood and sweat into learning how to trade. They just want to get paid and do no work for it. So it's definitely very good marketing on those chat rooms part. Um, but very unfortunate for the traders who actually think those are legitimate strategies. Yeah, absolutely. And I you know, want to thank you for sharing so much of uh, your strategies with us. And I think it's going to really help a lot of traders and uh, at least get them Googling in the right direction. But yeah, I think, uh, you know, we've definitely gone over our hour mark. Um, and unless you want, you want to continue the chat with anything else, I think uh, we could probably just call it a day and definitely reconnect on some of that volume stuff and see what we can throw together. Yeah, no, thank you for having me on this. Uh, it was it was a blast. I don't often get to chat about all this kind of stuff with a lot of people, especially over your voice, right? Yeah. So it definitely was wonderful. Cool. Hammer Trader, thank you so much for joining us once again. If you guys want to follow him, you can follow him on Twitter at Hammer underscore Trader. And on YouTube, you can search Hammer Trader. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you got a lot out of this conversation. Uh, we're going to be lining up some more interviews uh, with more of these short sellers, people that are trading these uh, highly volatile, very risky, small to micro cap markets, and they're really pulling money out of the market every single day. Um, it's a, It really is a shrouded niche, um, but we heard a little bit about what it takes and the level of diligence that it takes to really become successful in an area like this. So this is bear versus pig on activetraders.chat. I think it's a hilarious name, but I think you get the context by now. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you enjoyed this on YouTube. I'm going to be releasing a podcast as well as soon as we get going. As you can imagine, it's quite a bit of work doing all of this um, and uh, also day trading at the same time. You can follow me on Twitter at Dell the Trader. Uh, where I post uh, charts of my trades and uh, basically chat every single day about things that are going on in the market live. Um, ActiveTraders.chat, we have a video course uh, that you can take uh, if you want to trade the way I trade with market auction theory. I also trade these small to micro cap stocks, so I have a vested interest in learning as much as possible from as many traders as we can. All right, guys, I'll see you again next time.